Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Uh, have you met your pharmacist? Um, before we, I'm Gabriele Closerto. I'm the manager, I'm the director of science and research on Myeloma Canada. Uh, before we get to the presentation and to our, our presenter, I'll, I just wanted to go over a few things. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsors for uh, for their support. Uh, without their help, it'd be, uh, it'd be hard to do these uh, webinars and to do them as often as, uh, as we do. So thanks so much. Um, all of our webinars are recorded, so for, for, for those of you that are familiar with our webinars, they're all put onto our YouTube channel, so youtube.com. In the search bar, you write Myeloma Canada, you click on the little looking glass there, and you'll one of the first links you'll see is the Myeloma Canada channel. You can subscribe by clicking the red button. Once you're subscribed, you're going to see this little gray bell button that's going to show up. Um, that's basically to get notifications. So uh, if every time uh, Myeloma Canada adds a video to the channel, you want to receive a pop-up on your phone or... or or, or whatever other device you use, then click the bell and uh, you'll get that notification. Uh, you can also ask, access our uh, YouTube channel through our website, so myloma.ca resources. Uh, you have a lot of different resources you can access here, but the ones for the webinars, it's the educational videos. You click on that and you'll be forwarded to our Myeloma Canada page uh, directly. So that's just an easier way to get there. Uh, how to ask questions. So uh, usually for our webinars, we ask you to type in your questions using the questions function. So it's the same thing whether you're using a phone, a computer. This is what you'll see if you're using a computer. Um, if you're using uh, a, a, an iPad or, or a phone, it'll be a little questions button. You type in your question, you click the send button, it'll send to me. But for this specific webinar, we'll ask you to use the chat function. I think uh, everyone's pretty familiar on how to use chat uh, since we've uh, been using uh, virtual technology for a while now. Um, so same concept, you type in your, your message there, you click on the send button, and uh, we'll be sure to answer your questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, and and we also have some we have a few questions that are going to be during the webinar, so we'll also ask you to to, to type in some uh, some of your responses uh, in the chat function during the webinar. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce to you our presenter today, uh, Tina Crosby, who is a clinical pharmacist in hematology and uh, at, at the Ottawa Hospital Pharmacy, as well as past president of the Canadian Association of Pharmacy and Oncology, also known as CAPL. So Tina, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to, to come and share your knowledge with, 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 with us today and uh, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you very much for, for having me here. Yes, I wanted to put in uh, also to let you know that I'm the president of, uh, of CAFO and like Gabrielle was saying, we've been uh, so familiar with Zoom and uh, technology in that the last two years. My My joke is that I was the president all through uh, the pandemic, so I was the virtual president. So now I've been going on so long that I'm now past president. So hopefully I won't be the virtual past president and we'll get together and meet in person again soon. So what I wanted to do was just take probably about 30 minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes and go over uh, things that we do as a pharmacist. So that's why I wanted to title this, have you uh, met your, your pharmacist yet? Because because sometimes we're, we're there and uh, and you may not uh, necessarily know that we're there. And for myself, when, when we have any kind of uh, seminars or, or talks and that when I'm at home, this is often where I'm doing it. So it's the picture of me standing up at the computer with, uh, with my dog. So he often gets curious, want to come over and see what we're talking about today. And I've been a pharmacist for about uh, 23 years now, and a, a well, specifically in hematology, a pharmacist for, for 23 years and uh, 28 years as a pharmacist. Um, for volunteer activities, as Gabrielle mentioned, we have a national organization of oncology pharmacists that uh, get together and talk about how best we can uh, use medications for the uh, care of our patients. And then we also have um, education materials that are put out either through uh, magazines, uh, papers, or uh, uh, programs like this that I review for their educational uh, content for, uh, for our country. So I don't have any uh, 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 conflicts to declare today that are specific to uh, this topic about uh, what uh, pharmacists would do, but I have done uh, work before for other companies. And a lot of times it's about when a new medication comes out, we want to talk to each other as pharmacists and nurses and, and go compare um, best practices of this is what we found is helpful with this medication and you want to share that with others. So that's often what uh, 
what these uh, education programs are, are about. And then I always like to uh, make this statement early on in the, in the disclosures category is because really, you know, we are, as part of the healthcare team, our goal is to help you with medications and, and making sure you get the most out of them. But really, you are the experts in your disease. You know, you, you know how you feel when you take something and then when you tweak what kind of improvements you get and, and with something like myeloma, this is something that can act up and then settle down again, act up and settle down. So living with this, I, I must say that you are the experts and I always value uh, anything that you say as we uh, go forward. So I want to thank Gabrielle for, for having me here and then let's get started specifically for us as uh, pharmacists. So what I want to do today is to break it down into three buckets, three areas, and talk about what we do as a pharmacist for myeloma care. And like Gabrielle had said, please use the chat feature that we have here below and feel free to type any comments or any uh, questions that you have. And I thought I would get us started with, um, with doing one little chat just to get everybody typing there. So in the chat, feel free to type in your message here. Are you more of a morning person or a night person when you, uh, when you start your day? And for some people, this can change over, uh, over time or, or depending on uh, what day of the, the week it is. But I'm going to uh, see in the chat here and uh, I'll be able to see what your uh, messages are as they come in. And I'll start off that I'm a night person. I don't know how much of a night person I am, but I'm definitely not a, uh, a morning person. And then we'll see if we can see each other's messages here in the, uh, in the chat function. And then I don't know if everybody's is defaulted to organizers and panelists only, but uh, I put mine in as organizers and panelists. And I can see some coming in here, night person and, and morning. And sometimes it's nice to think about this, and I know we're doing this just you know to get us started today, but it can make a difference to say with dexamethasone, for example, like with, with steroids and, and just trying to see, you know, if I take this in the morning, will it wear off a little bit so I can get some sleep at night? Or if, you know what, no, I'm usually someone that I can keep going and if I take this going to bed, maybe I can get a little bit of out, a couple of hours of sleep before the oomph kicks in and that's enough to tide me over so that I'm okay. I think I'll prefer to take my dexamethasone in the evening. So sometimes it can, uh, uh, you can adjust your medications depending on uh, what works for you. And like I was saying before, we're multiple myeloma, like medications, you know, every, every medication will work for so long and then wear off. And when it runs its course, you know, then it's time to look and say, okay, well, what's, what's next? What else do we have? What tool do we have in the toolbox that we can use next? And doing all of this can be a full-time job for, for people that, uh, that are going through therapy. So when you think about, you know, your appointments that you have to do, picking up prescriptions, going for blood work. There's a lot of uh, action for that. So it can feel like a full-time job. And when we look at what supports we have, you know, you, you, it's nice when you have um, family and friends that know what you're doing and, and can contribute to part of that. But also there's the, the medical team as well. So looking specifically at the medical team, I want to emphasize the supports that you have there. And when we look specifically, you know, there, there's, some, there's somebody for something. So, you know, we have um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists that can help for things at, at home and movement is, is so important as you're going through treatment. Um, nurses, physicians, pharmacists, social work, you know, looking to see what, um, what paperwork might be needed to help with time off work or looking at insurances. So there's, there's a whole team of people. There's, there's many, many people that are available just depending on, on what is needed. And sometimes if we narrow into what the nurses and, and pharmacists do as, as part of your, your team, sometimes there can be overlap 
between the two things that uh, we do. And that overlap is okay, because a lot of times we want to be able to build off of what each other has said. And, you know, if you meet with the physician and, and the nurse first clinic, and then later on you're talking to the pharmacist, we, we want to um, complement each other's messages and build off and, and make sure that something that was said earlier is uh, clear and you have an opportunity to talk about it again. So it's, it's okay to have uh, overlap and, and we kind of look forward to that. I know when, when we uh, work together as nurses and pharmacists, because uh, everybody can bring a little piece of the, uh, the puzzle to, to what, what we're doing. So when I was thinking about today, like, you know, what, what is my goal of, of what I would want for somebody that's going through treatment? It's, it's really that you, you've been given these prescriptions, you've been given this therapy, and my goal with the tools that I bring to the table is how can we help you get the most benefit from your, your treatment? So I wanted to use Sandra as an example and go through three areas that I'm doing as a pharmacist when we're um, looking at your care. So I want to make sure that the uh, treatment that you have is the right one for you right now, that it matches to what's going on in, in your life right now. Um, when we know that it's the right treatment and everything matches up for what's going on, um, being able to help take the medication. Can we look at some uh, tools there and make sure that there's that you have what you need to be able to take what's prescribed? And then lastly, for the I, it would be being a drug information resource. So being a resource for you or for the uh, medical team for how to get the most out of your therapy. So I wanted to introduce you to Sandra, and Sandra was diagnosed with myeloma a few years ago in 2014. And when she started, she started with induction therapy with the goal of going on to transplant. So she had four months of receiving Cyborg D as her induction. So that included having um, weekly trips to the hospital for bortezomib injections into the skin. She also had to take at home her dexamethasone tablets and cyclophosphamide tablets. After that, she went on to her autologist transplant and then lenalidomide uh, maintenance. Now, if we go forward to 2022, Sandra is now 70 years old and her disease has acted up again. So she's going to be starting her first treatment as a, her, her first treatment for relapse setting. So it's, this is her uh, second line treatment. Um, currently, she's been having some new pain that's been happening in the shoulders and back and at, always having your blood work being done, she's noticing that, okay, yeah, my uh, my M protein is starting to uh, climb a bit more faster than, uh, than I would like. So as a pharmacist, I'm seeing new prescriptions for her for daratumumab, dexamethasone, and letalinamide as her uh, combination uh, therapy. So if I think about the three buckets that I talked about, I want to zoom in on the first one. And, and a lot of times for nurses and pharmacists, we, we have this uh, phrase that we use in, in the medical setting that, you know, is this going to be the right drug for, we want the right drug, the right person, right time, right now. So this is where I'm getting the right from. I want to I want to look at these prescriptions for these three medications that I have in front of me, and I want to check them for therapeutic appropriateness. And, and when we talk about that in pharmacy, some of the examples that I mean is that I'm looking at this to see, are there any interactions with Sandra's medications that she takes at home? Is there anything there that we can tweak and optimize? Or, you know, a lot of times we can have um, supplements that we can get over the counter or online. Is there anything there that we need to take into consideration just so that we don't have two therapies uh, butting heads at the uh, same time? The other thing for making sure that this is right for Sandra right now is how are her kidneys right now for being able to clear out these medications? What's her liver doing just to make sure that she's able to metabolize these medications as she, um, as she goes forward? 
So for her prescription, she was given um, a prescription for lenalidomide, 15 milligrams, and she'll do that for three weeks and then have a, have a week off. And when I'm looking at her blood work, I'm looking to see, you know, how, how her kidneys are, how her defenses are, liver, how's her um, glucose, for example. I'm trying to see, you know, do we need to make any adjustments? What do I think about this, um, this dose and this uh, schedule? And I do that for the lenalidomide as well as for the other two as well. You know, we, we all know that the steroids can wreak havoc on our sugars. So trying to see, you know, does this person have diabetes and we might need to make some modifications there to uh, account for the spike that we can see in the sugars around the days that the dexamethasone needs to be. And also, too, as a pharmacist, I want to make sure that we have all the support that we need to, to do these therapies. So for, for myeloma, I'm always thinking about bone health. You know, do we do we have, is this a time now where the disease is acting up that um, we might have to see about using a bisphosphonate again, a, a bone strengthener? And if we're going to do that, then how's cal Sandra's calcium? Do we need to add in a calcium supplement and vitamin D just to be able to uh, support that and, and have um, her bones uh, strengthened as we go through? Um, where we're using lenalidomide for Sandra, we also want to see is she already on something, for example, for preventing clots. If not, then this is something that we want to add, add in as well, just to make sure that we, we don't have that happening as she's uh, starting her, her therapy. And then I also want to make sure that she's got prescriptions for um, supporting her starting her, her first lot of daratumumab, for example, and making sure that she has medications there for, for preventing um, her body from thinking that this is something different and, and having reactions as she, as she starts on that. So I'm checking to make sure that we have supportive medications there for, uh, for Sandra to, uh, to get started. Um, one of the things that we look at to see is um, for Sandra starting right now is that, you know, what she's bringing to the table. So like I had talked about for people that have diabetes, for example, and then we're adding in steroids, or we want to make sure that we have a plan there. For Sandra, she was taking levothyroxine at home, or some people know it as a Synthroid or Eltroxin. And when we're starting on therapies such as this one with lenalidomide, sometimes it can make your um, thyroid function uh, fluctuate either up or, or down. So we want to just check and see that we have a, a baseline of, of where her thyroid is right now as we get started. So for her, when in, in our uh, Im imaginary scenario here with our imaginary patient, we uh, discussed this with the doctor and then had a uh, TSH added to her blood work at the beginning to make sure that, uh, that we just know where she is right now with that. So if we move on to our second bucket that I wanted to talk about today is that we know that Sandra's here and she's starting her, uh, her therapy for relapsed myeloma. And we figured out that, yep, yeah, everything is great for doing this right now. Then B is actually taking the medications and, and seeing what we can look at there for, uh, for supports. And right now, it's a great time in multiple myeloma that we have so many therapies. So the, the recent meetings that we had at ASCO and, and ASH and EHA, like, the big thing is the discussions around how to combine things and what order to use things. So we have so many different combinations out there. And when you start looking at the combination that you're prescribed, oftentimes you can have a different schedule for each medication that, to, that is in the, um, in the uh, therapy. So for example, for, for Sandra, she can have uh, her lenalidomide has its own schedule. Her dexamethasone has its own schedule of being weekly. And then she has the infusions for the uh, daratumumab as well. So you can have three different medications in your, in your cocktail having three different schedules. And that can be a lot to, uh, to uh, try to uh, keep straight. So in this second bucket of, of support for taking medications, 
one of the things that we do as pharmacists is just to make sure that are you okay, are you fine with, are the instructions being interpreted as they were intended? And a lot of that can be done through, um, you know, you, you, you telling the pharmacist, okay, this is my plan for at home. Does this make sense? Anything that needs to be uh, adjusted. Then once you get started on therapy, then it's to look at, okay, are there any supports that we can provide to keep you on therapy? You know, checking in and seeing, you know, are there any barriers that are coming up that are inhibiting you from continuing on with your therapy as you go through uh, each cycle? So Sandra met with the uh, physician and the nurse in the clinic and, you know, they made a plan of, yep, this is the therapy I'm going to be starting right now. She understood the schedule and the plan, especially like where I was saying, we've got three different meds doing three different things. But then when time to come to the pharmacist, she's like, okay, I just want to make sure I'm fine and that I'm interpreting this the way that they were telling me that they that this is how we're going to do this, especially at the first beginning cycle one there. There's a lot of extra meds in there to try to support and make sure that I don't have reactions to the infusion starting. So let's just talk this out and make sure that I have this as uh, as intended. And a lot of times we'll um, do this with a visual. So I'm, I like to have a, have a visual layout of what I need to be doing when. So we'll make this up with calendars and we'll kind of lay out, here's your template of, of what we can expect for the next few weeks of how and when to, uh, to use these medications. And if you meet with your pharmacist and, and you do have something like this, a lot of times what we like to do is to add notes on this in your own words. You know, like put down a reminder that makes sense to you. So then that way you, um, it'll make sense when you get home and you, and you look at this again. So feel free to mark this up and, and write on it, but use your own words that, that make sense to you as the person that's going to be uh, looking at this and, uh, and reading this. So it, it's a lot to keep straight and everybody has their own tips and tricks of what they do to uh, keep things straight. As you can see in here, somebody writing on their hand and, and I'm uh, famous for that as well. So if I have something that is totally, I cannot forget this today, then, uh, then I have this on, on my hand. And there's different options that people use. So some people find that blister packs help or, um, you know, a lot of times it's muscle memory. So if you are always taking your medication in the evening, maybe you're putting those tablets in the same spot all the time. So then that way it's, it's habit. I brush teeth, I go up to the cupboard and, and get my medication there. So a lot of times it's, uh, it can be muscle memory to, uh, to help get into the uh, pattern of, of continuing on with, uh, with treatment. The second thing that I had there is that, okay, once we get the schedule straight and we're in a groove of, of doing our, um, our treatments and stuff, is to look at, is there anything that can come up to uh, hinder me from continuing on with this? So looking at barriers. So what could be a barrier that can affect taking a medication? And that's kind of what we look at at pharmacists to see, okay, is there anywhere there that we can help? And some of the things that come to mind for me is like what I was just saying, you know, making this medication routine enough so that it's muscle memory is taking over that I know, okay, yeah, brush teeth, take them, take the medication. I'm, I'm in a, in, in a pattern of doing that as well. Other times other barriers can be other things like, like cost, you know, like it's, phenomenal that we have tons and tons of medications and, and options out there, but there can be a cost with some of these and, and looking at is there helps and support out there to help with the costs for, for being able to uh, continue on with, with therapy. Um, sometimes starting off with medications, it's, uh, it's fine and, and we're going great and we understand the schedule, but if things start to make you feel lousy, then, you know, you might be like, well, I don't know if I want to keep doing this, or I might want to tweak how I, how I take it 
so that I, you know, don't feel awful as I'm going through. So sometimes, sometimes that can be a barrier to uh, to continuing on with your with your schedule. And then the last one that I had there is um, uh, information or or hesitancy. You know, if it, we always want someone to feel comfortable enough that if you're wondering something ask away like that there's there's no silly questions there's there's nothing to you know everything is neutral but if somebody is like you know what i'm really nervous about taking this and and but i don't want to tell them that i that i'm nervous or that i don't want to let them to know that i'm not taking it feel free to to say what's on your mind because if if maybe there's something that is different in your scenario versus the other person so making sure that you have all the information that you need so that you can make an informed decision on um, on what you are wondering about so for sandra in particular when she was starting starting on on her therapy she was fine with the schedule and when we talked with her went over the calendar she's like yeah that's no problem but like a lot of us, you know, especially when we were talking about uh, doing so much on the computer for the last few years, some of the days seem to blur together. And she's saying, you know what, I'm fine that I know that when it's an infusion day, I can remember that I have to do my dexamethasone in the morning because, yeah, I know I got my appointment. But now when the infusions start to space out a little bit more and, and now we started off weekly, and now we're getting to once once a month. I can't remember if it's Thursday or not, like it's Thursday or is it Wednesday? I'm just having trouble with, with some of those off times. So that's a great thing to say out loud to your, to your pharmacist and just kind of talk out what do you think would work for you, for you at home to, uh, to be able to consistently be able to take that every week. And she said, it's not that it's causing me any trouble or anything. I just like, oh my gosh, it's Thursday and I totally forgot to take that this morning. I thought it was Wednesday. So talking with Sandra, like there's options. There's different apps out there, for example, that, that you can plug in that of what your schedule is so that it pops up and reminds you what you have to take when. Um, I had showed uh, pictures before of dosets and everything. So if you get into this uh, pattern of, of muscle memory of going to the dosette at the same time of day every day, then you'll see that, okay, yeah, those are empty. So oh, it must be Thursday because that's the next one there to be opened and there's something there. Or nowadays with our phones, we can, we can make a, a continuous appointment to pop up every morning to, uh, to say that, yep, yeah, this is time to uh, take the dexamethasone. Then the other thing when talking with Sandra um, later on is that she's finding that now she's having to run to the washroom more, more often. And this is something that you would want to be able to talk about with your nurse, pharmacist, or physician because you'd hate for Sandra to feel like, okay, I'm not going to take my dose today because I have to go out and I don't want to get out and, you know, have an accident or anything. And then you want to be able to try to think of, okay, what are some options that we can do so that you don't have to hold doses unnecessarily because you're also trying to live life as well. We, we need to be able to, uh, to merge the two together. So Sandra is finding that, you know what, my usual part pattern was to go to the washroom once a day when I got up in the morning, but now it, it could be up to five trips. That I, and if I'm out, I'm trying to see where's the bathroom and everything. So it's starting to be a, a concern for her. And so for us, when we know that some medications can cause this, we want to try to look at what are the causes? Is it the medication or is it something else? So a lot of times we may be reaching out to the physician to say, okay, you know, let's make sure that it's not, it's not something else, uh, other serious thing that we have to uh, worry about and intervene in a different way. Because really we want to be able to reduce how many trips that she's making and and how often this is happening. And if this keeps going, we don't wanna have complications from this. And if we can nip it in the bud now early with some modifications, then that's gonna allow Sandra to stay on her therapy longer and, and get the, uh, the benefit from it. So nothing is sacred in the hospital. We, we talk about everything and, and the goal for, for bowel movements is that you want right in the middle there. So see in the green circle in the middle, 
we want it to be like sausage. So easy to pass, smooth, not hard, not small little hard rabbit droppings like we have on top, and then not water either. So we want something in, in the middle. So having conversations with Sandra, trying to see, you know, what's baseline now. So, you know, what what's your fluid? What's your um, uh, movement? What kind of diet are you doing right now? Maybe we can make some modifications there. So a lot of times when we uh, when we have diarrhea, following a temporary brat diet can can help, like increasing toast and and rice and bananas, and that can help to just uh, slow that down a little bit. Or seeing, you know, are there any triggers in foods that are contributing to it as well, and and seeing if we can uh, adjust some of that as well. Also, too, to see as pharmacists we're going to talk about medications but what else is out there besides medications and see if we can um, use some of those local measures just to, to help with um, any kind of discomfort and that that's happening there and and prevent um, uh, irritation and that to the skin and like I was saying that Sandra had mentioned you know when she goes out she's looking where's the bathroom where's the bathroom so trying as we settle down the diarrhea having some coping measures planned out so doing that like knowing where the bathrooms are maybe having a change of clothes in in the car or um, carrying some um, depends like absorbent undergarments or wipes or you know just being prepared so it helps take the uh, the uh, stress reduce some of the stress with with what's going on and if Sandra is talking to um, the pharmacist, we want to go over, you know, what options are out there as medications to help with this. So sometimes loperamide or Imodium is another name, is something that we can use to help to settle down the, the diarrhea that's happening right now. And it, it's hard to have a general statement that would apply to everybody because it really depends on on what's going on and, and um, what other um, things people are bringing to the situation. But, but as a guide, depending on how severe the uh, diarrhea is right now, we may be able to start off with loperamide and see if that helps to cut down five trips down to three or down to two, but just checking in every day and just and not letting it go too long and seeing if that's working. And then if that's not, then we have other things that can that can be added on as well. So in the middle here, I had a picture, for example, if we're talking about uh, this is something from lenalidomide, for example, sometimes we can add in other things to the loperamide, like cholestyramine, for example, or uh, colvestivan, so that we can try to um, slow down the diarrhea and just get a little bit more consistency. And then it's also important to, to keep in touch with the pharmacist and with the team, because if this is something that, you know, our, our, these local measures aren't working, then we want to make sure that we go over to the hospital and see if this is something else that's going on, be able to uh, have some hydration and, and not let it um, get too out of way, out of hand before, um, before too long. Because if this continues, then it's something that maybe we need to do a pause on the medication or a dose adjustment. And uh, then when everything settles down, start back up and in. So I'm going to look in the chat there as well, just to see if anybody wants to put any comments there. And like I said earlier, you know, you you are the experts in, in your disease. And for the people that have... Um, experienced diarrhea or any kind of bowel issues before feel free to put in the chat anything that uh, we may have missed or that you want to do for uh, for sandra Gina, mm -hmm. Gina, sorry sorry to interrupt uh, it seems that people don't have a chat function so i wasn't aware of oh, this have, okay <laughs> yeah yeah so i had a few people who answered the first question who's the three three people who said they were night people um, okay. And and then I, I I kind of did a little test and I noticed that there is no chat function for for participants. It's just the question function. So the chat function is just for panelists. Okay, um, gotcha. So and I'm, I'll, I'll monitor the. Them. Yeah, I'll monitor the questions here. Right now we don't have anything, but if people can write okay. in their in the question sections, I'll be happy to read them. Okay, awesome. Uh, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Gabriel. Yeah. So and and a lot of times when we're when we're talking with people. People say, 
this worked fabulous for me. You know, please share it with somebody else that's going through the same thing. So if you have something that you found that was helpful for you, by all means, put it in that section that Gabriel mentioned for uh, in the answer section and would be something that we can uh, add to our toolbox for, uh, for Sandra, our imaginary Sandra. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing that I had there that I wanted to talk about today is as a pharmacist, we are um, also available for information. And who that could be, it could be you. So, you know, your pharmacist is available if you have questions. Or, you know, there's lots of pharmacists. So today we're talking about pharmacists that uh, work with myeloma. A lot of times if somebody has a question, say, in the community, so your community pharmacist is phenomenal. They are the experts for blood pressure, diabetes, you know, everything. They are jack of all trades. They know it all. And sometimes it's nice to collaborate. And if you have a question, as pharmacist, who do you ask? Well, you ask another pharmacist. No problem. So sometimes we're a resource for things, as you know, you know, that we do a little bit differently in myeloma versus if uh, another condition that was uh, using steroids, for example, or, or any of the medications that we share with other conditions. Or we might be a resource for the medical team and, and they might be asking us some um, information on, uh, on medications. So for Sandra, she had gone to a support meeting recently in her area, and then she came back and she said, you know, at the meeting, like we, we often say Revlimid. Everybody knows Revlimid, but then when we were there, somebody's saying, well, I take natlenolinamide, and someone else is apolinamide. So, and this, when she had called, it was during her rest week. She was like, what am I taking? And is there a difference between all of these? I mean, that, that's a great question. And this is something that I really liked that was on the Myeloma Canada website uh, last year. It was a nice info sheet for talking about medications, generics available in Canada. And, you know, what are they? And what are the criteria that Health Canada uses? What are the, the ongoing surveillance that Health Canada uses to know that for example, with lenalidomide, that all these companies that make it, that we can say that one is just as good as the other. So this is a, um, a link here to that spot in Health Canada, or even if you look at the, um, the pamphlet there on the Myeloma Canada website, you'll, uh, you'll see this question and answer there. And, and it's, it's nicely done because when a company, um, wants to put out a medication, they they have to submit that to Health Canada. So so we know that our, um, our original first product that was out in this scenario, for example, is Revlimid. So that company would have so many years, so say they have, say, eight years, they, they have so many years before their patent is up, and then that recipe is shared with, with other companies but they have to apply to Health Canada and they have to put in their package to show that, yes, we're gonna make this, but we are, um, it's good, the product that we're gonna make, it's, you know, it's not gonna be any different than how the uh, original product out works. It's gonna be, uh, the safety is gonna be the same, the quality is gonna be there. They have to use the, the recipe that was provided by the original company. So they follow that. So the actual ingredients, the, the powder for lenalidomide will be the same. How they put it together in the, in the uh, capsule, so the outside of the capsule, what's being used for the non-medicinal, that could be different, but the drug itself is the, uh, is the same. And really, this is not new in myeloma. Like, it's definitely not new in, in the world of medications, but it's not new in myeloma either. So, for example, I, I just off the top of my head, I was trying to put down for today, what are some things that we've already had before available by different companies? Velcade, for example, that was our, uh, our first brand that was out. There are other companies that make bortezomib. So there are different companies that um, have this recipe now that the patent is up and they, they make bortezomib. Cyclophosphamide. So we had Cytoxin, Procytox. There's other companies that, that make the, uh, the same medication. Dexamethasone, um, 
the example that I just gave for lenalidomide, and then even in the supportive care area, so the uh, loperamide I was just talking about, or for nausea or our bone um, bone strengtheners, promidronate, uh, zoledronic acid. So there's multiple companies that uh, that make the uh, the same medication, and when companies um, submit this package to Health Canada, they they have to have testing done. So so you, you get two groups of healthy volunteers, one that's taking the uh, the new product being te tested and requested, and the uh, originator product, and then they do blood work to make sure that at the certain points in time that you're getting the same amount of medication with the original and you're getting the same amount with the um, with the new medication and then they cross over and compare so so there's stringent testing done to make sure that when this drug goes in the body with the way that they follow the recipe that this is going to act the same way as the original one so even for how long it takes for something to dissolve or how long it takes once it gets to your stomach to then be absorbed or how your body gets rid of it. It, it all has to be um, the same and, and comparable so that it works the same and you get the, uh, the same benefit from it. And then once that's approved, there's still ongoing testing. So there's still trips to, to the, uh, the, factor, the factory and the manufacturing steps to, to go on, to continue on to make sure that what they said that they're going to do is still what they're doing and is the plan for, for the future. So by having these discussions with Sandra, she's like, okay, yeah, I see, you know, that there's a variety of companies and where the original company had the, um, the patent for the medication, then when they share the recipe, then that's often then put out by other companies at a lower cost. And then for, for us in, in Canada, it's often the same pool of where medications are covered, as in our, our highways and our roads and schools. So there, there can be some um, cost benefit to having more than one company make something. So this made Sandra feel, okay, thank you. Like I'm, I'm comfortable in, uh, in uh, what I have and what I've been prescribed right now. So hopefully by going over that, I showed you the three buckets of um, aspects that we as pharmacists look at when we're um, part of your, your myeloma care. And I wanted to leave you with uh, two final thoughts for, for what you can uh, do today. So by all means, it'd be nice to know who your pharmacist is and, and to have that for when, when you need it. So, you know, get the name of them, phone number, or sometimes people communicate by email, you can do that. Just the, um, your prescription bottle that you have for your, for your myeloma medications. You know, the, the telephone number is gonna be there. You can call and say, you know, who's, who, who would be my pharmacist that I can reach out to if, if I have a question? Or on the flip side at the hospital, uh, different places work differently. It might be that you're talking to the uh, physician at the office and they route you to the pharmacist, or you might see them in the clinic, or when you go for your chemo infusion, for example, you could ask the nurse there, like, you know, who's, who's the pharmacist if I have a question, and, and just write that down. And then my final thing is I wanted to give you some examples, so five examples of things that you could ask your, your pharmacist when you're talking about your myeloma treatment. And the first one is what we were talking about before. You know, the, this, is, this is what I'm doing with my medications right now. And that can be your, your induction treatment, it could be your fifth line treatment, your second, anytime. These are my medications, this is what I'm doing now. Do you see, do you have anything else that can help me to maximize what I'm doing here? Or if you're starting something new, what, what can I be looking out for as I start this? Is there anything that I can be looking out for that might be a flag that I want to call and, and let the, uh, the nurses and physicians know? Or, you know, if you're, you're having uh, symptoms, for example, that there's sometimes where the tired that I have, it's, it's not resolved with going and having a nap. Like, is there anything that I can do differently? Because the whole point of doing all this therapy is to be able to, to live life. So is there anything that you can think of that I can tweak here?
sometimes as you know and, I, and you would know better than me is that you know when you're starting on a therapy everybody means well and people will say oh my cousin did this my uncle took that you should try that you should try this you know if there's something that's of interest to you then ask your pharmacist you know somebody said their cousin took this as a supplement is that something that i can do now what's your opinion on this or like we were talking about at the beginning when i showed the picture of the man with the briefcase you know like doing all of this is a full-time job and and you have other things to do as well to uh, as part of your day if there's any tools that we can do by having a calendar or, or whatever you think would be of benefit we can do that to uh, to help keep keep going so I hope I gave you a little look inside our world of, uh, of what a pharmacist is doing as you're uh, as you're doing your treatment and you know if you have any questions or think of things by all means uh, reach out and, and find who your who your pharmacist is so I want to thank everybody for for listening today and now that we know the right box to use so if you have a question feel free to uh, to put it in the uh, question box and we'd be happy to uh, to talk about it or comments all right thanks thanks Nina, for that so we did uh, we did get one comment before from the uh for sandra who had some some advice for sandra and so this person oh, said um i found prebiotics and probiotics helpful nice yeah and and th that's great to say and and it would be good to like that i wouldn't be able to say a big blanket thing for everybody because depending on where you are in your point of care then your your pharmacist or even you know um, if you were talking to the dietitian they might have recommendations on what type of probiotics to get but yeah thank you because that's a great one that we can definitely use for for sandra so i mean i i guess i have a question in terms of prebiotics and probiotics is is is, is it one is one better than the other or are both recommended or is it recommended at all um i, I think it's a it's a timing thing so say for example if Sandra was right in the middle of her transplant when all this was going on. Like if she was if if she was doing that point when she was having the di the diarrhea, and depending on how severe it was, then we may not want to be using that depending on how her defenses were at the time. So if she was at a point in time, say where, you know, she had no neutrophils and no defenses, and we're just waiting for for um, recovery we may not introduce that at that point but if this is diarrhea that is say like with this if she's having her dara lendex and we've already did some adjustments with uh, diet and we tried modium, you know we can see then okay what well, it's it's another tool like what well, that might be another layer to add on and then it's talking to her do you want to do it as yogurt and and you know get a probiotic yogurt and see if that does anything or do we want to look at getting it as a capsule and uh, and trying it that way cool thank you um sticking to that uh, to that topic of uh, of diarrhea um, <laughs> the, um you know so we've we you discussed that lenalidomide is something that could potentially cause diarrhea in some people um from all the myeloma drugs for example can can it be caused by bortezomib or from cyclophosphamide can those also cause diarrhea yeah, yeah, and and every every cocktail is different, and then everybody is different. So for sure, like for some people, bortezomib could be the culprit. The Velcade, for example, that could be the culprit for them. That's uh, that's causing it. And depending on your your regimen, you could have one medication that's more constipating. So say, for example, if you're getting on Dancitron as your anti anti nauseant. Then, and then if you're having something else that causes diarrhea, a lot of times we just don't know which one's going to win out, and then we wait and see, and then adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. And and so let's say you're on something like RVD, so Revlimid, Bortezomib, Dexamethasone. How do you know which one is causing the diarrhea? Um, you kind of want to see when it's happening and and see if there's any um, pattern to it, just to try to see a timing thing. Is is it is it something that is happening, say, around my visits for for when I go in for my injections, for example, or no, this is trying to happen later on in the week when you know that's already happened, and then 
like with anything, if you uh, do some tweaks and see, okay, did that make it better or worse? And, and yeah, just try to do a time association with it. And then really we want to see how can we can slow this down and, and what tools we can use there to, to make it better. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so I just want to, uh, you know, if, it, if people can write in their questions in the in the question box, I'll be happy to ask them right now. I, I don't have any 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 additional questions. Um, I just wanted to maybe uh, I have I have a few questions to ask, but I also mm -hmm. wanted to make a, make a comment on you know how how important and timely this this presentation is. You know, as we know, the healthcare system is not you know in the best shape these days, um, and you know we we kind of tend to forget about the pharmacist, and a lot of the times it's hey ask your doctor or hey do this, but it, you know you listed off a bunch of things that, that the pharmacist can help you with. So 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 thanks for thanks for reminding us about that that you know the pharmacist is there and the pharmacist can help. Um, and, um, the question I had uh, it had to do with you know how, how you had a comment there saying oh my cousin did this can I do that and so a lot of the times when you when you when you get a cold or you get something uh, you'll talk to someone and say oh I'm taking high doses of vitamin C and it, uh, I love it so can, can you maybe comment on that and how high doses of anything maybe is um, maybe not the best idea for someone who's on active treatment yeah, and and sometimes I'll say to people, you know, it's like when you have a baby and everybody comes out of the woodwork and gives you tons of advice, or if you just get married. And a lot of times you say, thank you, and you just say thank you, and then you decide what you want to do and what advice you want to follow for, for, for your baby you just had, for example. Same same thing when you start treatment. You know, everybody means well. They 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 hear that you're going through something that, oh, like, what can I do? How can I help? I'm going to share this piece of information with you. And then you got to look and to see, okay, if it is, say, a supplement like high dose vitamin C, for example, or any type of supplement, like sometimes it comes up with immune boosters. I want to take something to boost my immunity. It's good then to go back, and, and that's where it's great if you want to talk to your pharmacist, for example, because then they can look and see, well, was this actually studied in people that had myeloma? Because mm -hmm. sometimes for us, for hematology and cancers of the blood, people are excluded from those trials. It's not to say that they don't work, like there's a lot of you know, immune boosters and, and high dose vitamin C is along there of you know, trying to uh, boost your immunity. But you know, for some of those things, in theory at least, it could also boost the disease and you'd wanna do that as well. Or for example, specific to us, like with vitamin C, then that can butt heads with the bortezomib, for example. So depending on what you're taking, um, you know, it, there's whatever you don't feel like you, you need to like, oh, I'm not going to tell them about this. Like, you know, say what you want to say and what you're taking, and then we can provide you with what we know about it and then give you tools so that you can help decide. It might be a time and place of, of when to use things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that make, yeah, that makes sense. So to kind of limit the uh, you know spatial spatially uh, um, separate things so that there's no interactions, right? Yeah, yeah, and and it, it's it can be it you know the time right now is that if you're doing this treatment, say for example, if you're doing bortezomib, then now is a great time to do this, and then maybe vitamin C can come in at at a later date, like just so that you get the the benefit of of both of those at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that, that totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'd be remiss not to ask about uh, about COVID. Um, <laughs> we uh, get a lot of questions uh, still to this day about about COVID. You know, we are in the seventh wave, I believe, in, in Quebec. I'm not sure about on, Ontario, but yeah. um, there's uh, some some treatments, uh, either prophylactic treatments or treatments where if you've tested positive. So uh, I'm thinking of the monoclonal antibody treatment. Uh, Evo sled and uh, as well as the uh, the, the pill uh, Paxlovid. So those those two treatments. So can can myeloma patients access those in Ontario right now? So um, Paxlovid, yes. So and and I always say you know every province it's like its own little country in terms of funding and 
availability and stuff and that's why it's great to have myeloma canada because then it'd be nice to be able to have something nationally <laughs> so past COVID, yes like for for here for example in ottawa and ontario our community pharmacists do that so so if um somebody with myeloma is is seen and they are positive and and they um, reach out to their myeloma physician they can get a prescription to their community pharmacy and the, putting on my pharmacist hat, um, the big thing that we do is we check for drug interactions because with the Paxlovid, for example, it, there are interactions with other medications because it's all getting cleared by the liver. So the pharmacist will want to do a double check and see, you know, maybe while at the time that you take the Paxlovid, we need to hold another medication at, for temporarily for five days or, or, or whatnot. So they'll do an interaction check and see. So if you have any questions that way, you can always speak to um, your myeloma pharmacist for that as well. Um, for the um, Evashield, right now in Ontario at least, um, I know um, for us here in Ontario, the province released a tiered system. So we think specifically in hematology, um, we've broken down into a, a tier system of right now we're trying to have that medication for people say that are having a transplant or we know for example people with um, that are receiving rituximab for example like a monoclonal antibody against B cells that um, that can reduce their uh, response so so they've broken it up into different tiers and I think mm -hmm. locally we're down to uh, tier two so it's kind of going through um, more specifically in blood cancers of um, who would be able to get that right now as a prevention medication. So we, we have at the clinic set up that referrals can go there from family physicians or from um, the myeloma team and a ref or, or anybody at the hospital like your oncologist and it goes there. But I believe it right now it's a, a tier system and we're down to uh, tier two locally right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess the the, the 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 next question I have is uh, going to uh, to generics, going back to the generics. And so you you had mentioned how um, you know they're uh, bi bioequivalent, so essentially the same the same drug, but uh, it's whatever filler they put with the pill that might be a little bit different between all the different uh, generics. Now, um, is it possible to have a reaction to uh, one of the generics, whereas let's say you were on the the brand name medication, you didn't have a reaction. It it's possible for sure. Like um, like with any medication, that's one of the things that you're looking out for is that if if you have a uh, an allergy or if you have a reaction and stuff to the medication, you want to let uh, the pharmacist, physician, nurse let them know. And and it's possible that you could have something and and. If you do, then we want to document it and then look and see. Well, what are what are other options are there for us? So it it is possible somebody could have uh, an allergy to um, something that's put in like one of the non-medicinal ingredients. So mm -hmm. that's possible, and and that's why it's nice to have variety because you still want to be able to get the benefit from the actual drug because you know that part mm -hmm. is the same and you wouldn't want you know something else in there to to hold that up so so through i know speaking from ontario like if if we document that yes we've had an allergy to this one's like okay we have other companies that we can try let's try this one and see if uh, if that's any any better and that you're not having that reaction and document that then we do have options to be able to have the the other ones um, funded as well. It's all about paying for these medications and, <laughs> and the funding because we want to be able to uh, to take them. So yeah, we can document if somebody is having a reaction to one and and then trying another one. Hmm. Cool. Thank you. Um, I, I have one more question here, and uh, I don't have any other questions that are coming into the chat, so I'll ask you this, and if anything else comes in, then I'll ask you that one, but if not, this will probably be the last question. So it has to do with uh, with transplant. So uh, my little patient would get a transplant, and we know that, you know, the first few months or, you know, they're, they're, mo the, the, uh, most, vul they're most vulnerable for um, acquiring some kind of infection. 
Now, um, I get a lot of questions about um, what they should be eating, and so I, I'm not sure if this falls under your um, under your jurisdiction. So if it's not, just let, let me know. But um, for example, eating something with like a live culture uh, inside um, is that something that could be dangerous to somebody who's recovering from a transplant? I I think it can, and and whenever I get questions like this, I often will reach out to the dietitian that we have, and and mm -hmm. and they're I think they're the best group to talk to because it's going to be how far out you are from the transplant, and mm -hmm. um, and specifically what you're talking about, and and a lot of times you and it's not necessarily only just transplant, but just as a general rule. You know, you want to you want to make sure that what you're what you're eating is is not going to make you sick. So, you know, if you're in the middle of doing chemotherapy, you may not get a hot dog from the person on the side of the the, the sidewalk there because you don't know how long they were sitting out or if they're properly cooked. So it's kind of looking at what's my risk and and where am I in my treatment and you know how much defenses do I have and or you know, when we had um, garden parties and there's egg salad sitting out, mayonnaise sitting out on a picnic. You're like, eh, for me, I, if I ate that, I might have a rumbly belly for a couple of days, but I'll get over it. So you kind of look, okay, what's my situation now? And is is that is that worth it? So, mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, I think I, I, for specific questions, I like to talk to the dietitian because then I get their um, their opinion of, of what it is in the the live culture like we're talking probiotics or we're talking um, blue cheese or steak mm -hmm. tartare. <laughs> yeah steak tartare or sushi yeah yeah, or sushi, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um i i guess the, the last comment i just want to make is, is in going back to uh to the whole uh, oh my cousin said that i do this and i do that and all that is that things change over time right so evidence changes and so just because you did something 10 years ago or a year ago or five years doesn't mean that it's still valid today um, and so that's why it's always good to check in with with the pharmacist and, and, and make sure that uh, that what you're what you're doing is 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 valid for whatever evidence we have today and not what and we have some stuff is changing for the good too like something that people were taking and found that this is a benefit then it's like okay let's move this mainstream let's look actually look at this and see if this is going to uh, to actually be complementary and, and help with our therapy. So yeah, so there's a lot of uh, good information coming that way too, as you said, as we keep looking at stuff and things change. Absolutely. So uh, Tina, I have a comment here thanking you for uh, for this. And I, uh, you know, I, on behalf of everybody on the line, thank you so much again for, uh, for doing this and uh, taking uh, an hour of your time to, to educate us on, on pharmacists. And uh, I hope everybody gets to meet their pharmacist. And uh, it was it was great, uh, great working with you. And uh, hope uh, hopefully in the future we can have you on again. Yes, thank you very, very much. Yes, go, go find your pharmacist. They're there somewhere. You just got to tweak around and find them. So hopefully you need a couple of tools of where to go look. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, take care. Thanks so much and uh, have a great evening. Thanks. You too. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.